Hello, I'm Brian Scordato, and this is the Idea to Start a Podcast brought to you by Tacklebox. Today we have an awesome guest. Agatha Kulaga, the founder of Ovenly, stopped by to talk through how she built a wholesale bakery that provides the best tasting sweets and baked goods to the best coffee shops, bakeries, and restaurants in the world. Ovenly started out as a wholesaler, but has grown into an institution with their own standalone stores and even an acclaimed recipe book. Agatha has an interesting background that's probably going to sound a lot like the background many of you have. She had a successful career in a stable industry before starting Ovenly, and she talks through the process and realities of leaving that job to pursue something far riskier. It's a great and inspiring conversation I hope you enjoy. Have a great week. Thank you so much for coming. I am uh, very excited to talk to you. Thanks for having me here. Of course. Um, so I think a good place to just start for people who don't know what is Ovenly. Wow. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> so Ovenly is a retail and wholesale bakery business based in New York City. And uh, we have five locations at the moment. And we wholesale all over to coffee shops, cafes, gourmet grocers. Um, and we also have an event space where we teach classes and have different events and workshops. And ultimately, we are a bakery business that um, – is interested in being the neighborhood bakery in every neighborhood. And we also have uh, social impact goals. So while we are working to bring joy to as many people as possible, we also want to um, work to scale our business responsibly. So we have a whole m mission around radical responsibility as we grow our business. Amazing. Amazing. One of the big reasons I'm so excited to talk to you is you've done something that I didn't know was possible. Like you scaled something that I did not think was scalable. Um, so I'm really interested in digging in on that. Um, it's a really cool story. So I was doing some background and generally we start with the original, like the ideation stage. Um, but you had a really interesting career before you started Ovenly. So I wanted to start with that. Like what was the first thing that you did after college and what did that uh, span of time look like? Sure. Uh, so I actually grew up working in restaurants. Um, so my first job was when I was 15, working at TGI Fridays as a hostess. Nice. <laughs> yes. And, um, and I ended up working in restaurants through high school and college. And during that time, I also studied psychology. And I, um, I really loved cognitive and neuropsychology. And uh, I ended up getting my degree in psychology. And when I moved to New York, I uh, ended up working at NYU School of Medicine in the mental health and addictions uh, research program in the psychiatry department there. And that was pretty much my first professional job mm -hmm. outside of um, outside of school. Really cool. And, and how mm -hmm. long did you do that for? I did that for 10 years. Wow. <laughs> Just under 10 years. Yeah. Amazing. So so I started off as a research assistant there and then ended up uh basically directing the the program in um, in mental health and addictions research there. And during that time, I also did therapy. I worked um, in New York City-based community treatment programs, um, mostly nonprofit programs. And I, uh, and I also got my master's degree in social work. Wow. <laughs> yes, I was incredible. busy. Yeah. yeah, and incredible. And, and like very interestingly, like none of that after the experience – working restaurants, none of that had anything to do with what you go on to start. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's kind of a next interesting next step is so where did the idea or when did the idea for Ovenly come and how did that turn from whatever it was in its ideation stage into what it is now? Yeah. Well, looking back on it now, it, if if you actually presented it that way, obviously it doesn't seem sure. like a very linear path. Um, but looking at back on it now, it makes so much sense to me because um, one, I really loved science and research. And I, um, while I was doing all of that, like I said, I worked in restaurants and I was always attracted to hospitality. And, um, and my previous career was really focused on bringing wellness or creating wellness for people. And um, a lot of it was around self-improvement and trying to 
you know, get people to a place where they could feel joy in their lives. And and I really relate that to what I do now where um, there's this element of trying to get people out of their, you know, all of the like hustle and craziness and and provide a moment of respite, prom- provide a moment of joy um, in a crazy day. And, and I, I do think that it's all related. But I also uh, I think that with the – the, the, throughout the whole process, I was really passionate about food and cooking. And one of the things that I did for myself through my career prior to Ovenly was that I had very stressful days and I worked with, you know, ve- people that were in very difficult situations. So I would take a lot of that work home. And the way that I made myself feel better was I would bake. Mm-hmm. And and then I would bring those baked goods to my patients and clients. Nice. And so it just came full circle where I realized that I could make people happy in a very different way. And I think I just got to the point where I felt a little bit, I don't want to say burnt out, but um, but I had established myself in that career for um, for quite some time. And I felt like I was ready for a new challenge. And And to me, the idea of hospitality and baking was something that was really interesting to me. And then I met my business partner, Aaron, and that's when we started really thinking through, okay, what would be uh, a business idea that we could take to scale? Very cool. Amazing story. And how did you guys meet? We met in a food-focused book club that my best friend um, from childhood, Kara, had started. So we were basically reading books about food and then cooking meals around the theme of the book. And I pretty much went to one meeting, and that meeting (laughs) happened to be uh, at Erin's house, and she was hosting. And um, we had an initial conversation there. I had brought these pistachio cardamom cupcakes, and Erin... Um, fell in love with them. We started chatting, and then we made a date to uh, get coffee at Colson Patisserie, actually, in Park Slope. And basically at that uh, next meeting, we decided to start a business together. So wow. we, we did not know each other before we started Evanly. Wow. Yeah. That is incredible. Mm-hmm. And what, what had she been doing? She worked in nonprofit arts management, and at the time that I met her, she was working for the National Council of Jewish Women. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that there's there are a few things that will definitely resonate with some people listening. Um, lots of people are in jobs. They have gotten a lot out of their job. They don't necessarily dislike their job, but they feel like it's time to move on. Yeah. And oftentimes they'll then look for some sort of company to start um, or something to uh, something else that they can transition into um, that they're more passionate about. So I think it's really interesting to dig in on you have that coffee, you meet, have that conversation. What were the next steps? Like what did, how did you lay this out? It, we did not go into, uh, starting Ovenly with a business plan. We really, we spent about a year, um, thinking through the types of business ideas that we could potentially, uh, build upon. And we, it was like, you know, it was like, throwing pasta at the wall where like seeing what stuck, you know, it was really about testing things out. We were, we were definitely, um, doing some cooking and baking, but we were also doing menu development and we were doing catering. We were doing crazy jobs and nothing was really, nothing really had a laser focus. Um, but the opportunity really came when, uh, a friend of mine was opening up a bar and she was going to be open for service during the day. She was going to have a cafe there. And she approached me and said, I know that you make amazing baked goods and I'm opening up a cafe. And, oh, actually this is the part that, so we had, sorry, let's take a step back. So we had decided what can we scale and what would be fun to do and where is the gap where is the gap in the market and we decided on gourmet bar snacks that was our original ovenly idea Come on. so nice. so we developed some bar snacks and started selling them to brooklyn brewery amazing so this this was the sorry i missed the the big part of uh, the beginnings of ovenly so ovenly was initially a bar snack company and then my friend heather approached us about um 
about baked goods. And she said, I'll sell your bar snacks, but you have to make my pastries for the morning. And hmm. some of them have to be gluten free. And, really? um, and I think many people could probably relate to when you're first starting a business, it's very hard to say no to anything because you're just kind of like, I'll, I'll take whatever <laughs> I can get and go with it. Uh, and that's essentially what we did with Heather, which she was opening up Veronica People's Club in Greenpoint at the time. And so she started selling our bar snacks and we started making pastries for her. We had no experience in scaling pastries or the production of pastries. Everything that we did was like by the dozen. And and the pastries started taking off and the bar snacks didn't. And suddenly we had other people coming to us and asking for our pastries. And we we didn't even have a – we barely had a business at that point. And what we realized at that time was that there was a major gap in the market for high-end – interesting flavored pastries. And the reason that um, there was a need for them at that point was that um, there was suddenly, it was around the time that there was the rise of um, these higher end coffee shops and coffee roasters that were appearing in New York City. And there were only a few wholesalers of pastries at that time. And they were mostly traditional French pastries. And you know, we were wild and crazy and we were like, let's make a cheddar cherry basil scone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were putting together wild combinations because they were based on what our tastes were in food. And, you know, we're really adventurous and we like to have fun with food. And so it was really this moment where we didn't even realize the need for this, but... um but these coffee shops were buying wholesale pastries that were either, like I said, traditional French pastries or they were muffins that were wrapped in plastic and tasted like shit. Even, <laughs> am I allowed to say that? Yeah, um, so so that was really – that was a moment for us when we realized that there was a need for what we were doing and there was – there were not that many people doing it at scale. And, um, and so it was really – you know, it happened organically – we didn't go in with the intent to do it. And mm. actually prior to that, one of the conversations that we had when we were talking about starting a business was that we never wanted to own a bakery, <laughs> <laughs> ironically. And here we are nine and a half years later. Awesome. Uh, I have a bunch of questions about that. <laughs> um, first question that doesn't matter much, but I'm super interested in mm -hmm. it. What were the bar snacks? Uh one was called Old Salties. They were bacon, fat, roasted Old Bay peanuts. <laughs> there was another – we did um, maple thyme pecans that were a little spicy and, you know, uh, sweet and salty. We always had this theme of sweet and salty except for mm. the Old Salties, which were just salty. <laughs> uh, and then we had a spicy bacon caramel corn and then we had a sweeter one that was an almond. I don't even remember what that huh. one was. Yeah. That's and that was it. We had four, I think. Did I mention three or four? I think that was I four. Those sound yeah. good. They um, were they were great. They're actually really delicious. And I think about bringing them back, but you know, when you are have a whole bakery production going on, you don't really want to get into bar snacks suddenly again. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I have to mention this because it's silly, but I had a dinner with some friends recently in the startup world and we were doing nerdy startup world yeah. things and we were like, what's the worst startup idea that you can think of? Bar snacks. And no, no, no. <laughs> Mine was, you mentioned Old Bay seasoning. Uh -huh. I was like, I think Old Bay is delicious, but it's like amazing on everything. But I had just come from a family thing and my little cousin had never heard of Old Bay. He's like 18. And I was like, oh, we need to update. Yeah, which like broke my heart. <laughs> <That's> crazy. <laughs> I was like, we need to update Old Bay. I'm going to make a new... Uh, like something that tastes exactly like Old Bay, but just ca just called Young Bay and then spelled B-A-E. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, that's amazing. Don't give that business idea away. <laughs> so I was like, that's the stupidest thing. And then as I thought about it, I was like, Maybe. That's so good. Yeah. So if anyone Or just call that, it Old Bay B-A-E. Yeah. <laughs> but then, I like New Bay. <laughs> um, oh, you said Young Bay. Young I like Bay. New Bay. <laughs> new Bay might be better. Um, so if Ovenly comes out with New Bay, you don't know where it came All from. All right. Um, awesome. So – on to more important stuff. Yes. So you mentioned scale, yeah. fun, and gap, which yeah. I think are really, really interesting, like, core, like a North Star for something that you want to do. And I think people might want to think about that. But I have some questions on that period of time. So you were like, all right, let's make bar snacks for Brooklyn Brewery. Yeah. 
did you still have the other job at that oh, point? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we were producing out of our homes, which is totally illegal. <laughs> so you were like cooking in your kitchen. Yes. Working full time. Working full time. Yeah. Multi, like what sounds like you had like multiple hats yes. at your regular job yes. and then doing this. Yeah. Um, so just silly questions that I think like the strangest friction points will actually hold people from not doing something. Um, so how did you think about the downside of like were you incorporated at the time? Did you like have a company or a website or anything like that? We incorporated in 2010. So, yes, we definitely – we knew – we had landed on the name before, you know, we knew exact, like precisely what we were going to do. But we had incorporated. We had done all of that. So we were officially a business. Yes. Cool. Okay, mm-hmm. good. I'm not trying to get you in trouble. No, no, we absolutely were. Um, awesome. And – It's a very smart thing to do. You, you have the name, incorporate. Cool. Um, and I agree. So, so what I think is really interesting is you just sort of like got yourselves in the mix as fast as possible. Yeah. And by doing that, you were able to test out a couple of things and find an actual gap in the market because you were out there and then you were able to capitalize on it. And I think that's like a really interesting perspective to take on, like so many people will not do anything. They're like, I need to quit my job and then I'll figure this stuff out. And sort of this like linear progression that isn't necessarily the way you'll get to the business that matters. Yeah. I, I think that there is one we we thought the gap there was a gap in the market for high end bar snacks right yeah. and that was our big business idea and that was something that we saw as very scalable um, and more along the lines of what our vision for our personal futures was and um, and that gap you know that didn't whatever we were creating didn't necessarily meet that gap um, but I I also think that what we were very good at was the hustle and pivoting, right? So, you know, we are both we we both had worked in hospitality and in restaurants, and I and I do think that um, working in res- restaurants gives you a sense of grit and gives you a sense of adaptability that um, that you can sort of apply to anything that you do. So mm-hmm. when we started and we realized that this pastry thing was taking off, we just sort of hustled and made it happen because that that was the opportunity that presented itself to to us. And and I think a big part of the beginnings of our success was that we came to a decision and we sort of iterated after that, you know, if something didn't work, we just quickly made changes and Mm. kept going without overthinking things. Because I think in the beginning, as you say, if you have another job, it's very easy to just over deliberate on everything. And if you don't take that step quickly, someone else is going to do that and fill that gap. And so I think that you know, if you are motivated and if you do know that you want to start a business and you're committed to that, it, it's it's better to just, you know, start or get started and, and move along and make decisions and change as needed to test things out rather than – I do think business plans are very important and we did develop one, you know, soon after that. But I getting started and getting your foot in is really the first step. And sometimes that's the hardest one and and prevents people from doing anything. It's so interesting because we've had a number of, I mean, I've done a number of interviews prepping for the next 10 weeks of the podcast in the last like two weeks. I've done like a bunch of, of conversations with people who have been really successful. And I keep hearing the same thing where they had an initial idea. They weren't really precious about it. They didn't have a business plan. They sort of tested things out very quickly. An adjacent idea presented itself, and they just pounced on it. Mm-hmm. And I, I wonder if, like, even the process of being too precious about idea, putting, like, a whole business plan around it before you really start, kind of creates this interesting sunk cost where you're not actually able to then, like, take advantage. Because, like, that's the thing you're, you were supposed to be doing, not this new thing that's presented itself. Yeah, I agree. There's so much that changes on an hour-to-hour, day-to-day basis when you're first starting a business that I do – again, I, business plans are very useful. Strategy is very useful. But in the beginning, even if you have a business plan – that is going to change and evolve mm. every single day. And so I, I do think that there's an amount of flexibility that's needed where you're not just sitting there looking at your business plan and, and thinking about your next step rather than just taking it. So there is – it's a very important element. And I think as an entrepreneur especially, um, you know, things are changing all the time in terms of the needs of the market. But I do think the one thing that Aaron, my business partner, and I – 
uh, we're very we're very committed to and we were on the same page about is that we knew we never wanted to compromise our values and we knew that whatever business uh, we ended up with and whatever product we are putting out into the world, that it would be one that we believed in. It would be one that um, we would stand behind and if it were edible that we would consume that we would feel passionate about where it wasn't just about making money it was it was actually something that we believed in and that was representative of our value our personal values as well cool cool and you've definitely done that which is great let's get back to that moment so you tried bar snacks you pivoted you've sort of hit this is it called third wave the coffee yeah wave? yeah uh-huh. this oh, like yeah. I, was, I was gonna say and then i was like is that too weird and i obscure? was <laughs> debating between yeah. third and fourth in my yeah. head um i got it right um so you hit this third wave coffee shops popping up they have this need so most coffee shops at this point i think now they don't have their own bakeries for the most part no or? okay so they're bringing in baked goods mm-hmm. that are in plastic bags that stink. Mm-hmm. And you recognize... Plastic wrap. Plastic wrap. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and you recognize this opportunity. So what was yours and Aaron's first step towards like scaling a business where you're mm-hmm. like, okay, we have multiple customers now. It's There's like a lot more at stake. So... Our growth was definitely organic and our business was also that came to us was organic. So we did not do any sales in the beginning hmm. ourselves. All all of the business was word of mouth and came to us, which we were very fortunate for. Um, but truly the one pivotal moment for us was uh, we were – we had, you know, started to do very small scale bakery production for some coffee shops. And then Jonathan Rubenstein from Joe Coffee approached us. And at that time, they probably had about 12 locations. And um, and someone had put him in touch with us. And uh, and he said, you know, we're, we're looking for really great pastries. Can you do this for us? And we were like, uh... Yes. <laughs> we, we, you know, at that point, we certainly were not prepared for that volume. But of course, the business opportunity pre- presented itself to us and we said yes and we made it work. And at that point, we really needed to professionalize in a, in a much deeper way where we had to think about, okay, well, what does scaling this actually look like? How do we get it done? Who do we need to do it? And, and so forth. So that's really where some of the, the more strategic business planning t- took place. And, um, you know, and I think ultimately a bigger investment into what we were actually doing where it was like, okay, this is a real thing Mm -hmm. and and how do we prepare for this in a way where we make this a successful outcome so how are you feeling in that moment when he's like can you do this and you say yes ecstatic and we we were and we also i think that uh again there was a lot that we taught ourselves uh, in the very beginning, and we had a lot of incredible people that we used as resources for you know everything that we were doing. And I was never afraid to ask for help. And I think that that was something that you know for both of us, it was so important in the beginning years of our business, and and continues on today because the information is out there, right? And I think it's about um, being humble and and not being embarrassed to ask for help when you need it. And so we talked to as many people as possible to figure it out. And I definitely got in touch with other bakery owners and I said, hey, can you can you give me a tour of your place? Wow. Can I can I hear more about what you do? And some people were like, of course, I would love to do that. And some people said, absolutely not. And, you know, and to me, it was a learning experience as well in terms of shared resources, and and what it means for business owners to support each other. And it's something that I have, you know, sort of taken with me to this day where as a business owner myself now, when uh, new entrepreneurs come to me and ask for guidance and advice, I am so happy to give it because, you know, I just want other people to be able to experience success in the businesses that they're building. And the information is out there. They're going to find it eventually. And why not share our resources uh, because it takes a lot of work and um, and it's nice when businesses can help each other out. Sure. So I have a question on the scaling piece. So if I were – I'm very interested in food businesses and every time I think about scaling a food business, 
I get terrified because because it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and there are just these extra variables that you don't have. If I'm making a notebook, yeah, I know how much generally how much paper is going to cost, but I also know that paper is not going to go bad, and I can buy paper. And if it sits in a warehouse for a little while because orders aren't what I think they're going to be, that's fine. You can't do that, especially when you're offering a like a truly premium, delicious product that needs to be fresh. Right. So you get these deals. How did you think about – so you'd worked in the hospitality space, mm -hmm. but unless I'm wrong, you hadn't like scaled like supply chain for something like no. this before. So no. how, how do you go about thinking through that? It's very tough. I, I think that um, there were so – there's so many things that I would have done differently. And in the beginning – at least in my experience when we were starting the business and scaling, we weren't necessarily thinking about – because you're so – because I was so stuck – or not stuck, but you're you're involved in the day-to-day -day and wearing so many hats that you're doing so many things that sometimes it's hard to take a step back and say, okay, what's scalable and what isn't? And one of the things that I would have done differently in the, in the very beginning stages of the business is said, okay, you know, what are the products that we're offering? What are the services that we're offering? What's scalable? And what is just m much harder to scale and doesn't make sense for the business long term? Hmm. And it's something that I think about now because obviously the decisions that we make now in the business is, is about what is scalable and and, you know, I think that this is where the the differences between people that start businesses as a passion because they, let's say, you know, love to bake and want to start a bakery versus um, people that feel passionate about something but are actually looking to start a business and scale a business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they can – they're both equally great, but it's very important to sort of – look into the future and see, okay, so the person that loves to bake and is starting a bakery, do you want to be in the kitchen or in the bakery making things for, you know, the entirety of your business? Or do you see yourself actually running a business? And what does that mean? And what are the skills you need for that? And and both my business partner and I, we knew that we wanted to grow a business. We didn't want to just be a mom and pop shop. We wanted to grow a business. And so we never had this intention of, oh, you know, I want to make scones for the rest of my life and they're going to be great and I'm going to develop recipes and that's as far as, as it is. We knew that we were going to need a team to do that and and our passion went beyond just, you know, developing recipes. And, and so a big part of it that was important was, you know, as we grew, it was the the business decisions behind the things that you're doing are very important. And for something like a fresh baked good, it's very different than, uh, you know, develop, starting a CPG company where, you know, something is shelf stable. And what does that mean for the longevity of the business? And, you know, how does that impact things? And so, Yes, you know, we have to make things every single day and we have to bake things every day. And that's a different type of investment. And, you know, to be frank, it's a longer term investment, right? It's not it's not necessarily a business that is going to show these spikes in revenues and be able to give investors a return on investment, you know, within a year because it's something that grows. But at the same time, um, we steadily grow year after year. And one of the things that worked for us was that with a CPG product, let's say, when you're putting something on a shelf that's shelf stable, a store might place an order and you may not hear from them again for three months or six months because they place a giant order and that's it. Where our product is such that it gets replenished every day or every other day. And so we know we can anticipate our sales and our business day to day and month to month based on the fact that everyone is ordering consistently very regularly. And that's something that has worked in our favor. But it is challenging in the sense that, you know, even for shipping, we do e-commerce and we ship our cakes all across the country, but we have to ship them today and our cookies, we sh ship them today. And um, because we do everything fresh and we don't use preservatives, we use all natural ingredients, they don't last as long. Um, but, you know, my hope is, is that people will just come back to us every day for more. Yeah. Incredible. I have two. Does that answer your question? It... That, was, that was a long-winded answer. I... It was super helpful and it spurred like seven more questions. Okay. <laughs> so um, I think there there are two threads that I want to take on that I think are really, really important and I'd love to hear your perspective on. So the first one is trade-offs. So like any business, 
Something that I've been thinking about a lot is I think people don't understand what a trade-off really is. I think in life you can have trade-offs that are not where it's like, well, I'm not going to have, um, I don't know, I'm not going to have uh, dessert today, but I'll have it tomorrow or something yeah. like that. And that's like, that's kind of a trade-off, but it's not actually a trade-off. A trade-off is like two really good options and you have to get rid of one. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot that I'm thinking about. So you have to balance being like opportunistic versus thinking about scalable. Mm-hmm. So you might have an opportunity to do something for someone. And this happens to all um, startups early on, which you alluded to earlier, where you start as being opt- opportunistic. But at some point, you kind of need to phase out of that and say, like, we're actually not doing those types of opportunities because they're not building the type of business we want longer term. And then you have to you have to have trade-offs around quality, where you want a certain level of quality, but you also want something to last for a certain amount of time. And you want the ingredients to be such that the price is affordable or meets the standards or whatever that a a coffee, whoever is buying Mm -hmm. this has. And then you have the pricing trade-off for yourself where it's like, again, with the ingredient stuff, like how high do you want to make this price? And then if you make the price low, then you probably have to live with that price for a long time because it's hard to raise prices. So I just threw a bunch at you. Yeah. But- I guess the first thing is like, how did you, can you talk about when you started to be less opportunistic and more focused on like longer term company scalable stuff? I think the moment with Joe Coffee was definitely a moment that we, it was more about, okay, what is our long-term investment in this? What do we want out of the business personally and professionally? Because that was really, that's where we were committing to something bigger Mm. um, than we had you know, at that point anticipated because we were still, we were very small. And, uh, and I, and at that point we really started to think through, you know, what do we want our business to look like? Who are the people that we want working within our business? Um, you know, what is our long-term, what are our long-term goals? And, and so much of that was, you know, also thinking about our values, um, and what, what we, what our products would represent when they were out in the world. And, you know, and I think that there is this difference between when you start growing and let's say you have a B2B business versus B2C, there's, you know, that's where some trade-offs exist. And for us in the very beginning, we started off as a wholesale business. And, um, and again, we didn't really have a plan of, oh, we're going to be, we're going to have stores and not wholesale or vice versa. Um, that that is sort of the opportunity that we had. And then we started wholesaling and we got very, you know, deep into the business of wholesaling. And then we realized that we also, you know, we were losing a part of our brand and our identity as we were wholesaling because while we were very fortunate to build our brand without having a storefront because we didn't have the money for a storefront, we were missing that direct contact with our customer base, right? And so then it's about okay, well, what's the trade off? And um, and I and I do think that we really valued the relationships that we built with our wholesale clients. But then at some point, we really needed to you know have a face to our company. And so that's when we opened up our first retail shop. But as we scaled, there was this conversation of you know I, I think that there's a tendency, let's say, when you have a B two B business to you know produce things uh, as economically as possible. Mm-hmm. And um, and that sometimes diminishes the quality. But for us, because we were building a business that we believed in and that, you know, we wanted to have stores and bake shops, we we were never OK with diminishing that quality. And so up front, we had always decided, you know, we're using high quality ingredients. We're mindful about the things that we're putting into our products, how they're made, and we will never compromise on that. And that's something that we've truly maintained throughout the course of our business to this day. And um, and I think that both of our natures to be scrappy helped with that because with vendors, with, you know, with uh, the business that we were doing, we are very good at negotiating. And, um, and we're really good at figuring out ways to be able to cut our costs where they actually don't impact, you know, or don't, there's no trade-off, right? So so that's really what we focused on where it comes to the trade-off. Okay, what's, it'll never be a trade-off with our values and, and what we're presenting to the world in terms of, um, you know, our, our brand or our, our product. And that was, um, that was really important to us in the beginning. But 
we never, you know, in the beginning, we weren't costing things out. And to your point of pricing and all of that, you can't backpedal, right? So you do have to really think through that. And the one thing that I would say that's so essential in the very beginning is to make sure that you are on top of your finances related to that, that you're costing out your product, that you're sort of forecasting what that's going to look like, especially with, you know, volatile markets and ingredient prices changing all the time. That's something that is so essential because otherwise it's just it's not possible to really scale at a level where it's not going to impact your business negatively. Mm. We'd had uh, somebody came on recently and talked about a book called Profit First, which mm-hmm. is an interesting way about um, thinking about your margins, mm-hmm. especially from early early on. Because I know at least I had with the previous company I had, this was my instinct to like, who am I to charge this amount of money? I'm going to yeah. charge as little as I possibly can. We did Um, not do that. (laughs) (laughs) Which is good in the way you should. Yeah. Um, But if you think about your pricing from, like, here's the margin I need to have to have a successful business, Mm -hmm. and then the price comes out of that margin rather than um, going the other way and trying to price comparatively to what someone might have. Yeah. And I think that we were very sensitive to that from the beginning because we're selling cookies. It's not like we're we're not selling $100 items. These are, you know – cookies for 350. So what does that look like when you scale and what do you need to make to actually exist as a business? And that, you know, that is, that corresponds with how much rent can you pay to, and how many cookies you need to sell to pay that rent. So that is all very important to think through first. So you talked about feedback loops. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really interesting. You have an incredibly fast and tight feedback loop since your customers are reordering constantly in the wholesale business. So like, how do you leverage that? Or do you think about that for a way to like test out new products and get feedback immediately as to whether like new baked like items or new different flavors of scones, do you sort of leverage that feedback loop to test, do some product testing or is that dangerous with customers? No, we, we do do that. The best place to do that is in our retail stores um, oh, yeah. and, and in our test kitchen. So, um, so we, we have actually been doing a lot more of that just because we actually have the space to do it now where before – there were so many other operational things that we had to figure out where that was um, that was a little bit more challenging. But we also do things like you know customer surveys all the time and client surveys all the time, and um, and that really does help. We're we're very very um, intent on always getting feedback from from the people that we're working with. So generally, when we test out a new product, what we've learned though is that you need at least three months to to test out, especially, you know, in our bake shops, if something is going to be well received or not. I think oftentimes we would test something out for like a week and say, oh, it didn't work. It didn't sell. But people are creatures of habit. And so just for people to sort of feel a little bit more experimental and want to purchase something that's different from what they generally purchase takes a little bit. And and you also have to have buy-in of your team to be able to do that and speak to that. And so it's more of a process than um, – then I think, you know, when we first started the business, we initially had anticipated. But there's there's definitely more strategic ways to do that where it's not just like a week of testing and saying, oh, this worked or it didn't work. It doesn't mm-hmm. – for us, it doesn't work that way. Cool. We have a lot of startups who are B2B2C. Mm-hmm. So obviously you have your storefronts now where, you're, where you have a B2C component. You have multiple customers in that B2B2C model where you're selling to the business, the business is selling to the end user. How did you think about dealing with those two layers of customers and who are you ultimately building the products for? I know both, but like, were you thinking like, we need to make something that the end user is going to love or that's going to work really well with the business of the the whole, the whole person you're wholesaling to or was it just kind of a balance? I I think it's it's a little bit of both, but it, in the beginning, it really was about creating an awesome product that everyone would want to experience. And it was about, you know, again, sort of filling this gap that existed, but it was really about getting to the end customer. And uh, and for us, we knew that we wanted to reach as many people as possible with with the products that we were creating. And and again, I think that the we were fortunate fortunate enough where, or actually, I, I, it was also strategic where when we were making sales, let's say to our wholesale customers, we had very intentional conversations with our wholesale customers that talked about the products that we were 
providing and about how it was very important to us that our brand was represented when when those products were sold because obviously they're not packaged they're not branded so so many uh, of our actual wholesale customers that we worked with would brand our products from the start and that was very helpful to us obviously to grow as a brand and for us to develop a customer base that way so that when we opened up our retail stores people already knew us Um, but it was really developing great products that could reach as many people as possible and that branding opportunity I thought was one of the most brilliant things. Like I, I remember years ago going into every – so entrepreneurs have tons of meetings in coffee shops. Yeah. And like the good coffee shops that I would go in would have like branded ovenly baked goods. Mm-hmm. And I just remember thinking like who are these people? Like how did they do this? How is Joe or, or wherever? Like how – this is something that they're promoting and it's, it like speaks to the quality so highly, but then it also creates a brand and you get in front of so many customers. You think about people like walking through. Yeah. Um, when I was mentioning this week to some friends that, um, and I mentioned a, like a tackle box cohort that we were talking today and like everyone know you have amazing name recognition, Thank which you. is such an interesting thing and, and a departure from how like you walk in and you see, ovenly and then maybe right next to it there might be something that's that you don't make and there's no brand on it yeah i think it's fascinating you know what's interesting is that this was certainly not intentional but one of the things that is interesting is that a few of our products a few of our baked goods are such that so we we believe in chewy cookies uh not crispy cookies which means flat cookies right so from the beginning of our business we said we would hand scoop our cookies and um they sort of you know it created this texture and height with our cookies but a few of our baked goods our products aren't branded anywhere but they're so recognizable without ever saying ovenly which also helped it was certainly not intentional but you know our peanut butter cookie i have people that have texted me from mexico city saying your peanut butter cookie is here. Wow. And then they finally, they asked someone at the cafe and they're like, oh, we actually bake from their cookbook. Wow. And it was literally our recipe. And I think that that's, I mean, those are the moments that are so rewarding and incredible, but that's the part about brand identity that was not necessarily intentional, but um, but it worked for us. And, you know, I, obviously our cookbook also helped with that too, but um, it is definitely a, a constant experiment with how do we have our brand presence there even if our you know if our brand isn't on it if there's no ovenly sign you know what does that mean and and i th- i think a big part of it is that from the very beginning of our business we've when we've made our sales and when we've talked with our customers we've always presented our values up front and um and in making those sales i, I would say that you know the conversations that i've had with our wholesale clients the reason part of the reason that they work with us is you know yes we have a great product but they also believe in the values that we have as a company and so um a big part of you know our our partners presenting our brand is that they they are proud to you know have us there and they believe in our values and um and i think that that worked obviously um you know to our advantage in the sense that it was more of just selling a product to someone. Like we were actually developing relationships with our wholesale customers. And you know, the, Joe Coffee, let's say, we started working with them 2011, I believe, and we still work with them today. And that's something that I, you know, I get sentimental about because I'm so appreciative of them giving us that that opportunity and to have that relationship have lasted that long and and to know that, you know, they appreciate the partnership that we have and as as do we. It feels really great to do that because we're value aligned. That's great. And it's it's such a hard thing to build a business that has one that strong of a brand has those sorts of lasting partnerships. She's really, really proud about it. Um, I, I was thinking about, as you were saying, like being able to identify the cookies, whether they're branded ovenly or yeah. not, that is the pinnacle of any brand. Yeah. And I think about, you know, if you, you do a thought experiment and try and think about other brands that have that, weirdly, the first one that comes to mind is like Bonobos, when the pa- like back in the day when the pants used to have the different color pocket liner. And you could say like, oh, those are okay. Bonobos yeah. pants. Yeah. Um, but they also fit differently than most pants at the time in yeah. 2010 or whatever it was. Um, but I think that that is something that even as early companies, people might try and aspire to because what you did was you had something unique and very differentiated and there was no – it wasn't, like, diluted and it was consistent. Mm-hmm. And so the, like, value prop came through really clearly. And I think that should be the goal for founders early on to be, like, that focused, unique, and differentiated that someone can identify you from your 
core competency. Yeah. Um, if you can do that, you might have a good shot. The two things that we've always talked about from the beginning of our business that we we know we excel at is making a really incredible baked good and great customer service and building relationships. That and that to us was sort of the core of our, you know, at our at our foundation and it's something that, you know, has continued all along that has never changed. And it's interesting. I wonder if it overlaps with some of the stuff you were doing prior to Oven Lately. Do you think that some of the stuff that you learned in your first career has helped? I, I think the things that I learned in my first career were more, I love research and, you know, I obviously worked in academia before and so much of what, um, you know, building a business is about <laughs> finding out as much information as possible all the time and teaching yourself things. You know, I didn't go to business school. Um, and, and so much of, um, what we did in the beginning is just researching everything about building a business, about baked goods, about, you know, baking. And, um, and so I do think that that's a big part of it, but then I think, you know, I, I dealt a lot with, um, people and, um, when you build a business and you have employees, so much of it is people management. And, you know, I think there are so many hard things about business, but managing people is always hard. It's it's not an easy thing to do because no, no two people are the same. So, you know, you can't have a playbook on that. And being a good manager is something that um, I continue to um, continue to, you know, work to develop in terms of what can I do to better myself at how I'm managing and helping my staff grow and my team grow. And, and it's something that, you know, I think comes from being able to work with a variety of different types of people from all walks of life in my previous career, developed a lot of patience mm -hmm. and um, and also just adaptability in, in terms of how you communicate with different types of people. So I think that that's helped um, to manage staff. It's helped with sales, business development, talking to investors. A lot of it, it was it, I think, has to do with adaptability. Very cool. So my last question on some of the early stage stuff, is there a story that jumps out about something I don't mean to put you on the spot and like force you to brag, <laughs> but like, is there something that jumps out a story about something you did extremely well that was like really, really helpful to the business uh, from from the early days? I think about this a lot. Just what got us through, especially we we had the first few years of Ovenly were absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were underfunded, meaning we did not have really any capital to start with, which meant you know we weren't able to make that many hires. And I, I think the the thing that I did really well was being able to wear so many different hats. And um, and also, you can be a, a great entrepreneur and a great business person, but ultimately, for a business to grow and continue, you need to have dedication. And there's a level of, we talked about this earlier, grit that's needed in the very beginning stages where stuff is going to go wrong. There's going to be so many disasters and so many challenges. And I, and I think one of the things that Aaron and I were able to do really well was we were able to withstand all of, all of the noise and all of the craziness. And we kept our emotions out of it. You know, mm -hmm. ultimately it was about building a successful business and there were very painful times and a lot of, you know, hurdles that we had to jump through. But at the same time, we never stopped. We never questioned whether we should keep going or not. It was mm. just we went full force and we just kept at it. And And I do think that that really got us to where we are now, where there was never any hesitation. We were both incredibly determined. So I don't know if that answers your question about a specific thing, but I think that there's a, a quality that I look for now when we hire that's a little bit more instinctive for me, where it's about, you know, what, how someone presents in terms of how willing they are to go above and beyond and really just step into any position and, and get stuff done, regardless of what their experience is or what their role is. And we have, an, we have built an incredible team around that where every single one of our administrative management staff that, you know, sort of helps run things, they are so committed, but they believe in what we're doing. And they just, they are not, they, they won't say no to anything. Mm. No, I think that's a great answer to that. So you've raised money 
a lot of founders, so when we speak with founders early on and they're like idea stage, the earliest stage, I say, what are your next goals? And the thing I hear the most is like, I need to raise money. Yeah. And I tend to balk at that a little bit. And they say, well, for this business, I need to have money first. Um, for the business you started, I would have thought you needed to have money first. You didn't. You started it and then you raised money afterwards. Has there been a meaningful impact to the company past fundraising? Do you have any advice to people on whether to raise funding or not, or how it will impact the company, or any perspective on that? Yeah, we received an angel investment early on, and that money disappeared instantly, <laughs> of course, because we were growing the company. And um, and I do believe that when you think you have enough money, you need more money. Uh, that's seems to always be the case. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's truth to it. But, you know, I, I think one of the things that I, in hindsight, wish I understood better was um, in, in raising money, how much money we would actually need and how much equity you're willing to give up for the amount of money that you're raising. And in thinking about raising money and scaling, eventually, the more money you raise, the more equity you're going to have to give up. And so it's very important to consider what you're willing to give up early on, because if you give up a good portion of equity early on for a raise that um, at the time may feel substantial, but it's not, it will affect your future. And and so it's just very important to to think through that because if you're giving up a large portion of equity for – $10 million, it's going to feel a little less painful than if you're, you know, giving up a smaller amount for a much smaller amount of money. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's something that, um, you know, that we sort of learned early on. And then the other thing that – and I had this – the reason that I bring it up now is I had a few conversations recently with people that are currently raising money where oftentimes uh, – people that are starting businesses, their instinct is to say that it's probably better to raise money from less people, uh, more mo bigger amounts of money from less people than smaller amounts from a lot of people. And that was our instinct early on. And I feel differently about it now, mm -hmm. where smaller amounts of money from more investors often means that the people that are investing that money oftentimes are friends and family or people that are just excited about investing in a business and want to participate in some way, but ultimately their investment is not going to make or break their life and their finances. And so um, they probably will be hands off and not involved at all where you know larger portions of uh of money that you're accepting from from bigger investors there's going to be a lot more accountability and just a lot more to manage in some ways and so you know my impression was if we have 30 investors for small amounts of money it's going to be so much to manage but it's exactly the same mm -hmm. and so you know there's there's trade offs with with both and um it's just it, there are different scenarios to consider um, super helpful. I want to be cognizant of time, so I'm going to narrow my questions down to two more. The first one, which is a question I'm excited to hear your answer to, because we've asked this to a lot of founders who aren't necessarily in the food space. So I'm interested in your perspective on it. So if I was like, you need to stop doing Ovenly tomorrow, or mm -hmm. you you sell it. And I said, now you have to start a taco truck. What would your first three months look like? What would What would the first decisions be? How would you go about that? Do I get to ask the question of you can ask where is you this want. and is there a need for another taco truck? Oh. <laughs> or are we just doing it? We're going for the Let's, taco truck. Um, well, do you have another idea in the food space? Well, I'm just thought? wondering, is there okay. a need in the market for a taco truck? So that, that's a good <laughs> first question to ask. Um, I'm going to say yes okay. because we are making gluten-free. Cookie tacos. Just kidding. Ooh, that'd be good. <laughs> Or actually, so a lot of my friends have recently watched that documentary, Game Changers. I don't know if you've seen it. Oh, yeah. It. I just watched it. What did you think? It was interesting. I mean, yeah. I, I think that it presented a lot of great ideas. The research behind it and the statistics behind it, I don't know how uh, well established they are, but I thought it was really interesting and, and definitely made me think about certain things and uh, – and, you know, I do believe, obviously, there's, you know, this huge rage around plant-based diets and, and how, you know, that is better for the environment. So it was, I, I thought it was really interesting. Cool. So let's say we're starting a Game Changers plant-based taco, taco truck. truck. Okay. 
how would you think about getting started or like test that out, test the viability or get going? Well, I would make sure that uh, my recipe and product development was already, you know, there and probably have it have all of our recipes tested with 500 people or 100 people um, force feed tacos to everyone (laughs) I know and then get feedback. So a lot of feedback loops, surveys. You know, I would definitely start with a visioning exercise in terms of, you know, from the start, what does this look like? What is the five-year plan? What are the values of the company? Who are we trying to reach? All of the things related to, uh, you know, visioning and develop a strategy around that. And But I would also, at the same time, develop a budget that's probably, you know, one to five years out um, and and really look at the numbers and, and um, cost everything out before that truck was open. Amazing. That's a good, thorough answer. I like that. (laughs) That makes me think that we could do that. Um, My final question, the most important question, what is the best item that you have at Ovenly? What is your favorite item? It's such a hard question. (laughs) It changes week to week. (laughs) It really really does. But um, I would say I'll, I'll give you two answers. My favorite treat at Ovenly that I generally eat at least a few times a week is our salted chocolate chip cookie, which is our best-selling cookie. And it also is secretly vegan, which is not why I eat it, but it's just our, it's our best-selling cookie across the company, regardless of being vegan or not. But then uh, I really love um, our scones. So we do a cheddar mustard scone and we do Mm. a currant rosemary scone. I never ate scones until we started making them at Ovenly and they are, I think, the best scones in the city. Amazing. I've not had – I've had the cookie. I've not had the scones. I'll try them. Brought you some. No, you brought plenty. I'm, I've got a, I've got a whole bunch of good stuff coming. I'm very excited for it. Oh, wait. But then the pistachio cardamom bread is also one of my – my all-time faves. All-time favorite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I can keep going. <laughs> um, everyone – I'm sure everyone listening to this, if you're in in New York or even if you're not, you've probably heard of Evanly. Hopefully you've had the food. It's unbelievable. Thank you so much for coming. This was super interesting. We got to like half of the questions, but everything was too interesting. Um, We had to dive deeper into it. Um, Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. This was really fun. Thank you. Sure. I hope this was as helpful as I hoped it would be. Head over to GetTackleBox.com and click podcast to get some more detailed notes. And if you made it this far, please toss us a subscribe, a rating, and a review. Thanks. Have a great week.